Hello and welcome to today's webinar presented by Delubal Software. Today we'll be working in our structural analysis and design software, RSTOB and RFEM. The topic for today's webinar is tips and tricks for modeling in RSTOB and RFEM. My colleague Vilant Gotzer will be your presenter. He's a product and customer support engineer located in our Leipzig, Germany office. My other colleague, Sina Gebhardt, will be your moderator, answering any questions you may have. She's a product and customer support engineer, also located in Leipzig, Germany. And finally, my name is Amy Heilig. I'll also be a moderator. I'm the CEO of the US office located in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. If the control panel does seem to get in your way when you logged into this GoToWebinar, feel free to show or hide that with the orange arrow up at the top. We always want to encourage everyone to ask questions throughout the webinar. You can do so within the same dialog box. If by chance we don't get to all your questions, we'll certainly send you a follow-up email afterwards. And with that said, I want to go ahead and turn it over to my colleague Vila for the rest of today's presentation. All right, thank you very much, Amy, for the introduction. Uh, let me just check if you can see my screen. Yeah, that's fine. Um, today we have three topics, and we're going to start with uh, the first one in our stop. This is how you can detect and fix modeling errors and instabilities. We will also continue in our firm with um, one or two small examples for instabilities, and after that, we will check how you can connect members and surface elements properly. And in the last part of the webinar, I'm gonna show you how to model nodal constraints, uh, nodal releases, line and surface releases. So with that said, we can just go on to the RSTAB, our framework program. And this is just a very small example uh, framework you can see I have defined some bracings over here. And you can see that these are member type tension. That means if they're gonna have compression forces, they will be removed in the calculation. We have also some hinges, but in global Y direction, this is a rigid frame. So I will just try to calculate the self weight load case and as you can see the model is unstable in node number 17 we have a free rotation about the y-axis and i said that the model is actually fixed in the y-axis um, i know it's a free rotation about the y-axis it's not movable in y um, so for the y-axis uh, for the x direction we actually have to find the bracings and the question is why the model is still unstable. So this is a very uh, yeah, common case of tension members. And you can imagine if you have self-weight load case and you calculate um, the first iteration, probably all the tension members, they have compression. And in the calculation, they will be removed in the very first iteration at the very same time. And if you imagine the, this exact structure with all of the tension members, let me just remove them. It's gonna fall aside and um, yeah, that that's the instability, yeah. How you can fix it? Um, we have some nice tools for you in calculate calculation parameters. Calculate calculation parameters over here. And then in the middle, you can see we have reactivation of failing members. And on the bottom, you can see exceptional handling. <clears throat> and this option allows you to handle the failing elements like these bracings in two ways. You can assign a reduced stiffness to the failing members, or that's my favorite option, um, to remove them individually during successive iterations. I will try the first option and you can see that in 
in the end, the calculation was successful. And we have still two tension members working in this structure. And this leads to uh, the final results. What you have to take care about is that if you have a structure with, let's say, 150 tension elements, tension members, you have to you have probably have to increase the number of iterations in the calculation parameters. So if like 110 tension um, members are failing, you should have at least 111 iterations. Yeah. Let's also try the, the second option over here, assign the reduced stiffness. That means if you have a tension member in compression, the program will assign a reduced stiffness by a factor of 1000. So we can also try this option, run the calculation again, and it's fine. You can see that now all the, um, the members are working, all the bracing members with um, views members by type. Um, no, that's not beam. Let's just select the bracing members, select special um, member with type tension visibility. Like here you can see that all the tension members are still in the structure. Yeah, that means they just have a reduced stiffness if they have some compression. And both of the options in this example lead to um, final results. And with that said, we can just continue to the next example. Um, let me just give you one uh, extra information. For the bracings, if you have like cables, you could also add uh, initial uh, uh, pre-stress to stabilize them. Yeah, In this case, we have angles and I wouldn't add uh, a pre-stress in, in this case, but if you have cables, usually you will add also a member load as initial pre-stress. Okay, let's go on to the next example. That's framework number two. <clears throat> um, it's like the same framework on the left side and a smaller one on the right one. And these should be connected with these uh, with this like cable duct and you can just try to calculate the self-weight load case. And as you see in the graphic, the deformation looks quite strange. It looks like the cable duct is actually not connected. And yeah, what's the reason for that? We have some uh, tools where you can find out um, the reason for these uh, strange behavior over here. You can access this uh, with tools. You will find model check and there you will have four options like overlapping members, crossing unconnected members. That's not the case in this model, but we have independent systems and identical nodes. I will start with the independent systems check and you can see that we actually have two independent systems like the left side and the right side. So the question is, what's the problem in the connection? And we can check it with tools, model check identical nodes. And there we have four groups of identical nodes. That means nodes which are closer than this tolerance. If you can't find a group over here, you can also adapt the tolerance. But in this case, the nodes are so close to each other that the, even the tolerance of such a small value is enough to check it. Yeah, You get a information error in the graphic and if you zoom in, it still looks connected, but in the end, you can see that there's a problem. These are not connected and I can just like drag and drop this one or you can use the check again with tools model check identical nodes. Now I have three groups left and you can um, select what's gonna happen with these nodes. Nothing, um, that, that's not the solution. We want to unite the nodes. Okay, we can run the design. 
the calculation again. And now we have just 1.4 millimeters and that's fine. So let's move on to our finite element program RFEM to check also other types of instabilities. There we have a 3D framework, self-weight um, in the calculation parameters because I have also tension bracings over here. I already activated to remove the failing elements in specific iterations. And I will just try to calculate the model. But it's completely unstable also in the self-weight load case. And in the text, you can see uh, some additional info that also with a additional module RF stability, you can check um, the reason for this in instability. Yeah? And that's what we're gonna try now because you can see the red arrows over here that there's a problem, um, but actually that this is a trust member, this is a trust member, but this is Richard. There shouldn't be an issue over here. Yeah. So the red arrow in the graphic isn't always the reason for the instability. And therefore, just take a look at the RF stability module. If you have some results, you can check eigen, uh, eigenvectors and eigenvalues with the module, but we don't even have the results of one single load case. So what I want to find out is the eigenvector of the unstable model. That's what uh, needs to be activated over here. We can calculate the eigenvector and you get a lot of zeros because it's an unstable model. Also over here, we get some deformations, but it's um, not so useful. We just need to take a look in the graphic. And yeah, we actually have a problem with this frame and you can see that there are some hinges that might cause a problem. As you can see, yeah, there's a hinge and this one is also hinged and I need to remove these two hinges. So just double click on the table on the left side, remove the hinge, okay. Remove the hinge also on this side. And now we can just try to run the self-weight. <clears throat> Some iterations for the bracing members probably. And now it's fine, yeah. We can also check the critical load factor now in RF stability. We don't have an unstable model at the moment. So let's check the critical load factor. Oh, that's some still some problem in this calculation but anyway that's we can also check in the next model okay so with the rf stability module you can also find out the reason for the instability and you can adapt the model because you can see the reason pro probably in the graphic yeah so at the moment we can just go on to the next model that's the platform model over here still a framework we have some bracing members, truss members over here, um, sorry, tension members with some pre-stress assigned. And we have some surface loads applied on the members. <clears throat> and what we want to try is, yeah, we will just try to run the calculation, calculate all. So the load cases, they look pretty good, but as you can see the, the load combinations, they probably don't get a result over here. So we have a problem in the load combinations. So if you have a instability like this, in fact, the 
you have to think like what's the difference of the load combination to the result uh, to the uh, load case and the load case when you yeah we have maximum displacement warning um in the self weight we can check the self weight is according to linear analysis that means first order theory and the load combinations they are calculated according to p delta method that means second order analysis <clears throat> so the reason could be that um, i have a problem in the model itself or uh, the the model is um, let's say it's too weak um, maybe i have to change the cross section because um, if the model is too weak then you're going to have high deformations and in the end it's going to be unstable but if you calculate according to first order then you don't uh, calculate the results on the deformed shape and that's the difference so to find out we will just try to calculate rf stability with the results of the first load case that was uh, the self-weight load case so I will just select load case one, the self-weight. I want to have four eigenvalues. I can just run the design. And there you see that um, you get some information that's very interesting because the critical load factor is the information um, that, for example, in load case one, the self-weight, the critical load factor is below um, one. That means the model itself, it can just take around 3% th uh, of um, the full loading. Yeah? And with this 3% of loading, it will collapse like this. <clears throat> so in this case, um, I could think like um, maybe over here I have a lot of hinges and I will just try to remove these hinges and then we will recalculate the model again. So let's switch off the results. I will rotate uh, the view a bit, select the middle frame and then right click on one of these members you get the information that you've selected 24 members, edit, and then we can remove all the hinges. Okay, delete the FE mesh, and let's try to recalculate, for example, combination number one. Okay. <clears throat> and now it's like, 2.8 millimeters and it, it looks quite good. Yeah, so let's run the result combination and the result combination contains all of the load combinations. And if these um, are fine, I think the model is good. Yeah, 25 millimeters, that's maximum, that's fine. Okay. Some additional information for the RF stability. If you check the critical load factor, like for example, combination one, you get some interesting information if you have to calculate according to first or second order P delta. If you are doing a Eurocode three check, uh, there's actually a, um, a formula that says that if your critical load factor is below 10, you have to calculate according to P delta or second order method. In this case, we have around seven, and therefore we have to calculate according second order theory. If this value is above 10, like the second one, we have a buckling of the inner column, then it would be okay just to calculate according to first order theory on the undeformed shape because the bending moments won't change um, according to second order and it's fine for a first order calculation. All right, um, let's continue to the next model and the next topic. <clears throat> we want to check how to connect members and surfaces. 
like in, in this example, I have a 2D model. You can see it's just 2D and there's this uh, shear panel and it's connected to a column, to two columns, yeah. If you display a solid display model, you can see that actually the column is quite massive. And the question is how to connect this member to the column. In this case, I just, um, it's just connected in this node, but we will take a look at the results now and we will find out if this is a good solution. So already in the deformations, you can see that there's a, like a corner and also in the bending moments of the column, it, it's not a real frame bending moment. It's quite too small, yeah. And the reason for that is that the shear panel, it has a three degrees of freedom, like uh, translational uh, deformations, but the column, it has also a rotational degree of freedom. And this is a incompatible FE mesh in this node. And we have to think, how to connect the column with the rigid connection to the shear panel. And I will show you one solution. Um, and for that, I will just copy the whole thing. One copy and let's take a look. The dimension of this is around seven. So 7.5, I, I will use 10 meter as a displacement vector. And the solution in this case, I will try to define a rigid member over here in this region to connect the column to the shear panel. So member type rigid is already defined in this case. And I can just define it by clicking in this area. And then I will just copy it one time um, like this and the same thing on the other side. Another copy from over there to over there. If you don't know the displacement vector, it's easy just to use this picking tool. Press the OK button and that's fine. And we can just run the calculation again. And as you can see, I still have the bending moments over here and there's quite a huge difference between the 0.45 kilonewton meters on the left side and the 4.67 or 66 on the right side. And also on the deformations, you can see that now there's a rigid connection between these two um, elements, the surface and the member element. So if you want to connect a member with the surface, you should think about this fact that there's on the left side, there's just a very, very, very tiny um, like, like area or yeah, it's not in a real area, but um, you have to think like how to connect this in a rigid connection from the member to the surface element. <clears throat> okay. Now we will take a look at the last, um, no, not the last, but to the next model. Let me just um, delete the FE mesh. There we have a, like a small frame with some horizontal loading. And you can see in the deformations that, um, yeah, of course we have some horizontal deformations, but I what I want to do is I want to have a like a surface in the area of of this uh, in the plane of these uh, three elements, a rigid surface like a, a like a roof, like something like this, and but I don't want to use a surface. I want to uh, um, like connect these four nodes that they are connected in a rigid connection. I want to use um, nodal constraint for this. And therefore, 
I can easily right click on the nodal constraints in the data navigator, new nodal constraint. Yeah, uh, it's quite easy. You have to select all the nodes you want to connect. This one, this, this one, and this one, five to eight. You can define um, according to the constraint plane, x, y, y, z, x, z. You can see that the constraint conditions are adapting automatically, or you can define your fully like manual constraint as you need, yeah? I will just use the diaphragm constraint x, y plane and press the OK button. You can see the constraint looks like this pink um, lines over there and we can just recalculate the model. And now you can see we, we don't get horizontal deformations because these nodes are fully constrained in this plane. <clears throat> so in this case, we connected the nodes in a rigid way. In the next uh, three models, we want to release uh, something. So let's move on to the nodal release model. Um, there we have, it's quite an easy example. We have four members and they are connected in this node. So as you can see, the um, the members on the top, they have a eccentricity. I will just show you um, member eccentricity over there and it's defined according to the relative offset of the cross section. So if I would change the cross section, it will also change the eccentricity in the model. And it looks like this, we have a timber element on the top and a concrete member on the bottom and two forces like self-weight and one uplifting load case. And if I do it like this, I can just calculate the model. You can see that the elements are connected to each other also for the uplift. You can see in the member internal forces um, that there's a transfer of shear forces between the two elements or the four elements in this case. Um, and what I want to do or what I want to model is I, for the uplift, I don't want to have a transfer of the forces from the timber elements to the concrete. So it's only for the plus set direction forces for gravity forces, I want to have a connection, but for uplift, it's just lying on the concrete element and there shouldn't be a connection. And to do, uh, and to model this, we have a uh, nodal releases over here. Let me just change to the wireframe model and switch off the results. Nodal releases, uh, new nodal release. Yeah, it's again quite easy. We have to select a node we want to release. That's just node number one. We need to define a hinge. And in this case, um, let me just check which hinge to define. It's, um, I want to use global hinges, UY, and this one is important, UZ, and also the phi X I want to release. And for the Z direction, it's important to have uh, only a fixed connection or a, a, a fixed connection if there's a positive force in, the, in this direction. So we will use fixed if positive PZ. And if it's a negative PZ, it's a release, yeah? Okay, then we have to choose the elements we want to release and that's going to be the top elements. Press the OK button and we can just run the calculation for the uplift again. And 
as you can see in the shear forces there isn't a transfer of shear forces now the the concrete elements they don't have any forces also in the deformations you can see that these elements are not connected now but for the gravity loads if you recalculate the model there should be a connection yeah you can see the deformation is quite low and also in the shear forces we can see that there's a transfer of the loading <clears throat> so for 1d elements you can use the nodal um, nodal releases over here now we want to take a look to the next dimension to the line release so that's basically the same but with uh, one more degree of freedom in this case we have a wall and a surface element and if you calculate the self weight load case you can see that both of these surfaces they are connected fully rigid in the corner over here along this line number four but what i want to do is i want to have a release that there's no transfer of bending moments from this surface to this surface and to model this we can just change to data and we want to have a new release which is a line release new line release and along the line number four i guess yeah line release type we want to release for of course the rotation phi x and if you have a like um, connection between these um, two surfaces you can also define spring constants in the translational releases or if you have a partial activity you can also use friction a diagram etc in this case we just keep it simple with a rotational release phi x okay and we want to release one of these surfaces and i will just choose the upper one surface number one okay we need to delete the fe mesh you can see the line release shown in the graphic and i will just calculate the self weight again and you can see that there's no rotation or no bending moment transfer from this one or from this one to this one <clears throat> okay so let's move on to the last example which is uh, this column foot over here let me just switch off the visibility mode we have a column foot over here with the horizontal loading and on the bottom this this is an, isn't a member element it's all made of surfaces and on the bottom we have a, the the foot is made of two solids that's solid number one and we have another plate which is located over here solid number two and in the at the edge of this plate we have also surfaces and this is um, like the weld along this plate at the moment it's fully uh, rigid connected and we can just run the calculation of the horizontal loads load case Yeah. Okay, so at the moment you can see we have around 1.2 millimeter deformation on top. Um, let's take a look at the column foot over here with the partial view. And yeah, we have no deformations at all. It looks like, yeah, of course, like these two solids are connected in every FE mesh node. And that's what I don't want to have. I want um, to have a um, release between the two surfaces or between the two uh, solids if you have uplift force because if you have an uplift force 
then uh, these forces should be transferred with the with the welds and the question is how to release the two plates yeah and this is what you can do with a surface release that's the additional degree of freedom you will find in this list on in the data navigator nodal release line and now we have the surface release right click new surface release which surface to choose um let me just switch off the results and we're gonna select the surface number seven this one we need to define a type of release and we want to release all the degrees of freedom and we again have a non-linearity for the z direction and the set direction should be fixed if you have a positive contact force, PZ. Yeah, if you have a compression force between the two solids, we want to have a connection. If you have uplift, then it should be released. Okay. And we need to release some objects and this is gonna be the solid number two. Yeah, the upper one of the two solids okay just delete the fe mesh again and now we can recalculate the load case and we will check the results Just need a second in this case for the failing surface elements, I guess. But now it's done. So let's check the results now. And you can see that for the uplift, we have some deformations on the upper surfaces now. And that was quite a huge difference between, yeah, in this case, we have 0 0.10, uh, 0 0.1 millimeter, but um, before it was completely rigid and there was exactly no deformation in this column foot. So uh, you could see that the release is working now for the uplift and we have a very different type of deformation now. So let's uh, summarize the webinar in, at this point. Um, at the beginning, we checked the instabilities in, your, in different models you saw that you can choose between different types of exceptional handling for the failing elements in the calculation parameters, both in r -Stab and RFEM. Next, I showed you how you can check the model. In RFEM, you can see you have also additional checks for uh, overlapping lines, overlapping surfaces, etc. You can check identical systems, identical nodes, etc. And after that, I showed you how to define nodal constraints and in the end, how you can release um, nodes, you can release lines and you can re release surfaces. With that said, I will just um, thank you for your attention and I will give again uh, 
the possibility to Amy to have some additional information for you. Thanks, Bilant. Uh, we do know that was quite a bit of information, so we always want to encourage you to visit our website at deluwal.com. Here you can find much more information on both our sub RFM as well as our add-on modules. We also have many social media sites, so between these two and our website, you'll find access to videos such as recorded webinars, uh, events and conferences, when those will take place, knowledge base articles, as well as upcoming webinars that will occur in the coming months. Our email for our German office is info at deluwal.com. Again, that's info, I-N-F-O, at deluwal.com. The phone number is plus four nine nine six eight three. 92030. If you do have any questions or comments about today's webinar or anything else, feel free to either send us an email or give us a call. And with that said, we want to thank everyone for attending today. And as always, we hope to see you at our next webinar. Thank you.